author of Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine, uh, released in 2016 with Schuster, Eight Flavors is number one bestseller on Amazon, The Atlantic Cookbook, richly researched, intriguing, and cleverly written. Formerly the curator of food programming at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, she has lectured at hundreds of universities and institutions worldwide, including the Museum of Science Boston, uh, the American Museum of Natural History, and the New York Public Library. And she has her new book is due out next summer, so we really hope that she will make a stop here um, for that. But today, in case you didn't realize, today is the first day of fall. And uh, to me and many other people, there's no greater symbol of fall, especially here in the North, um, than the apple for picking, eating, placing on new teacher's desk, or making into hot or hard cider. But did you know that we're endangered? Um, in fact, apples have been called the country's most endangered food. Uh, currently, 86% of apple varieties grown in the US have vanished, and four out of five are on the brink of extinction. But thanks to the hard cider revival, rare apples are being saved. In this session, uh, Sarah is going to cover the history of apples and hard cider in America and trace the story, stories of three revived rare apples. Um, and tonight, Sarah is going to take us on the hunt for endangered apples. And so, uh, please, please, please share any comments or questions you have in chat. Uh, Sarah really loves to interact with the audience, so um, ask away. And uh, use the Q&A module if you'd like to as well. Uh, and then at the end, if there are any, if there are any um, additional questions. Oh, sorry, I'm on Wi-Fi. Um, okay, I'll connect to the hard connection. I'm just going to turn it over to you, Sarah. That's fine. And actually, I appreciate that comment because I was worried it was my connection. No, uh, I think it's mine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. And that same thing. I, I can see the chat bubbles too. So if there's any issues with my audio, with my connection, please do let me know. Um, hi again, everyone. I love coming here to speak to you. I feel like Chelmsford is like my number one fan. So I'm always so thrilled to come back. If this happens to be your first talk with me, my name is Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian and I'm an author. My first book of flavors came out in 2016. But tonight, not only are we going to talk about apples and cider and like get really deep into these fall vibes, I hope the weather is very fall out there. I live in Las Vegas, so it's a very fall like 93 degrees today. Um, but this talk tonight is actually based on a chapter from my upcoming book. Yay. So this is a little preview um, that not many people have seen just for you all. So my next book um, is called Endangered Eating, Exploring America's Vanishing Food. I am any day now going to get a publication date on it. We're really, really sort of moving forward towards it actually getting published, which is always so exciting. Books were a really long process. My first book, Eight Flavors, took five years from writing a proposal to publication dates. Same thing here. I wrote the proposal in November, November of 2018. And we are looking at hopefully a summer 2023 publication date. So this book is exactly what it's about. So I've used this really interesting sort of encyclopedic reference called the Arc of Taste that is assembled by Slow Food International. And it's a list of delicious and distinctive foods that in many cases are on the verge of extinction. And so I found compelling stories from this rather this like kind of encyclopedic online ref reference. Um, and I traveled the country to all different regions from upstate New York to Hawaii to research these different foods. And so tonight we're going to talk about cider apples because I love, 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 love that Jessica put those statistics up at the top of this talk that 86% of apple species grown historically have already vanished. In fact, um, looking at references published around the turn of this century, um, these references mention between 11,000 and 17,000 unique apple varieties, okay? And today, we only uh, commercially grow uh, less than a thousand apple varieties. So we've lost an incredible number of apples um, may already be gone, but there is a little bit of hope in this chapter too, because even in just the scope of investigating uh, this story, I got to sort of witness an apple being rediscovered, that there is an army of pomologists. Those are people that study apples um, and like citizen, homologists, historical adventurers, 
out there who are, are literally stomping through the, the fields, I will be sharing my screen momentarily. Thank you for the reminder. Who are literally out there stomping through the fields looking for extinct apples and hoping to find them once again. So that is the journey we're taking tonight. This is a chapter from my upcoming book. I do hope that when it comes out, Jess and I were just talking about me coming in person, which would be really, really fun. Um, but certainly you'll be hearing more about the book as it comes out. So let's dig in. So here we are, The Hunt for Rare Apples. I'm Sarah Lohman. You can find me at social media at Four Pounds Flower. Um, additionally, you know, my email is pretty easy to find. If you, if you want to find me, I'm easy to find. I'm out there. SarahLohman.com. Thank you so much, Jessica. <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned already, in historical America, there were around 14,000 unique varieties. Here are a sampling of just a few. I love, love, love these um, sort of apple charts that sometimes you'll start to see. You'll see photos of them online, but you sometimes see them in person too with all of these little apples that you have maybe never heard of individually labeled. And when you put them next to each other, I mean, you can see how distinctly different all these commercial varieties are. Now I'm actually gonna begin um, in the middle, close to the end. So where do these apple varieties go? I think is the big question here, right? That you're probably already asking yourself, how did we lose these apples? And I love this one because I mentioned already that there were these amateur pomologists, professional pomologists out there looking for apples and that they literally are making these wanted posters with drawings and his, uh, descriptions from historical sources, hoping that somebody might walk into their backyard and realize that the tree they thought was some wild apple tree is actually the Carl apple or the cherry field or the Fairbanks. So it's a combination of a couple things that apples really disappeared between the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. One of the things that made apples disappear was beer, believe it or not. So we were largely a cider drinking nation up until the middle of the 19th century. And the 19th century between the 1840s and the end of the century, there was a massive immigration of people from uh, what today is Germany, but there, especially in the middle of the 19th century, was sort of a shifting, kind of loosely aligned collection of German states. So millions of Germans uh, immigrated to America, moved into the big cities, New York, Chicago, of course, I'm from Ohio, very, very German there. Uh, if you're from Pennsylvania too, very German there. And I bet that there are German, uh, I know you're famous for your Irish immigration, Germans were coming at the same time, and I feel certain that there is probably some German beer halls out there in Massachusetts, too. So Germans famously drink beer, and the only beer available in America up until this point was ale, the British style. And Americans broadly just liked the German lager beer much better. It was a lighter beer, both lighter in flavor and also lighter in alcohol content. It hits usually around 4 to 6 ABV. Um, additionally, lager beer is served cold, and in the middle of the, 19th, middle of the 19th century, America had launched this ice industry, which had made ice very affordable, and people loved to drink cold drinks. So we had this massive cultural shift, um, also brought on because uh, in the middle of the 19th century, we were becoming much more of an urban society, and it was much easier to brew beer in city breweries than it was to make cider, where you had to like ship um, a raw, rotting, rather bulky agriculture product into the cities as opposed to grain, which could store and transport it easily as well. So big cultural shift brought on by the Germans, we started drinking beer instead of cider. That's component number one. Component number two is ultimately prohibition. But prohibition didn't just drop out of the sky in 1919. The roots had actually been planted way back in the beginning of the 19th century in approximately the 1830s. The reason was uh, from the colonial era through the early half of the 19th century, America was drunk. Um, we were drinking around four gallons of alcohol per capita. Uh, per year. And I'm not talking like four gallons of cider. I'm talking about four gallons of ethyl alcohol from all sources, including cider. So temperate, the temperance movement came out of a moment where uh, we thought America should sober up. And I, I also know what's already on your head. Okay, well, they drank a lot back then because the water wasn't good. 
I'm going to bust this myth right now. Okay, yes. In America in the 18th and 19th centuries, some cities were having problems with their water as we were beginning to learn how to deal with a lot of people living in congested environments. And even for people on the frontier digging muddy or sandy wells, it could be a difficult situation. On the flip side, America is also famous for the quality of its water in some locations. If you take a moment, you probably think about Kentucky bourbon and Tennessee whiskey made from filtered, the beautifully limestone filtered water and fresh springs of that area. Even New York State likes to brag, uh, brag about its naturally limestone filtered water, right? And by the early 19th century, many cities were installing sewage systems and aqueducts, which were solving many of those water quality issues. And yet, America was still drinking. So why did people drink so much back then? I think the easiest way to answer that question is to ask why we drink today. We enjoy different flavors of beverages. I mean, today you can walk into any mini mart. There's everything from like Gatorade to iced coffee to fruit juice to soda, right? But there weren't so many options historically, especially if we're talking the 18th century. To drink something other than water or milk, um, even coffee and tea wasn't drank as much as alcohol. It was around, it was abundant, it was easy to make. You could make it from things that you had on hand. And especially if you're making it at home, it's only very lightly fermented. Um, people also liked the, the socialness of going out to drink, um, whether you were in an urban society and living in a small apartment or whether you were rural and your next neighbor might be miles and miles away, coming together at taverns and bars represented community and socialness too. Um, people like being drunk, being drunk is fun. It's just a tiny joyful poison basically. And I had another reason. I mean, there are, the reasons are many. Anything that, any reason you drink today is the same reason people drank historically. Temperance, however, pushed back on that. We kind of needed it. By the 1840s, Americans were drinking less than one gallon per person per capita. So that's pretty incredible. However, the movement ends up going too far when we get to prohibition and alcohol is effectively banned. So interestingly, uh, oftentimes a lot of like homemade alcohol wasn't necessarily banned. Making cider, which was categorized as a wine, was not necessarily illegal. Not, neither was having a cider apple tree on your property. But there's a lot of social pressure in the 1920s during Prohibition. And so having a cider apple tree on your property was like, oh, well, what are they doing? What are they doing with all those apples then? Are they at home drinking? So there was social pressure that the people responded to often by chopping down their own apple trees, okay? And then almost at the same moment as prohibition hits in the 20th century, we see a commercialization of just the, the apple industry specifically, but grocery stores more broadly, all right? So as cider apples are getting this stank of uh, temperance and, and drunkenness, Orchardists then are tearing out their cider apple trees and they're planting what are known as dessert apples or culinary apples. Those are apples that you can take a bite off and eat, you know, fresh and raw and also baking apples. They see those two categories as being more reliable than selling cider apples because, you know, you can't commercially make cider anymore. At the same time, refrigerated rail cars become really common. And so that turns apples from being a pretty localized crop to one that can literally be shipped across the country in cold storage. As a result of this, this the apple industry decides it's easier to limit the amount of apple varieties grown so that they can focus on marketing and promoting a few varieties rather than a huge diversion. So this is basically how we end up with like Granny Smith, Red Delicious, Gala, which is, you know, made a big resurgence and it's now America's favorite apple. It bumped Red Delicious out. But these like really basic apples and some of you probably remember from your youth going to the grocery store and there's only red delicious there year round. So even uh, there's been a, a, a resurgence in abundance of culinary and baking apples recently with all the newer varieties coming out from universities like Evercrisp and Zestar, and I'm sure you could name a few too. They've all got, so they're new apples, but I love the diversity. So that's the three-pronged attack. We started drinking beer, the temperance movement literally cut down cider apple trees, and the commercialization of apples in grocery stores limited the number of varieties available to us. So that's how we went from around 14,000 different varieties to around 1,000 being available. And certainly when you go to your corner grocery store, there aren't 1,000 different apple varieties available. So in this research, I found three, three apples that I found had really compelling stories 
And I'm gonna share those Apple stories with you tonight as a way to walk us through the Apple history up until this time, up until these three things came together and all these apples began to disappear. And I'm also gonna talk about the cider makers today that are working with these heirloom apples. And even if you don't see one of the brands or one of the apples that I talk about specifically today in your local grocery store, um, usually now most main chain groceries have a section of their beer, beer area. If you, I mean, again, I'm talking as like an Ohioan and a Nevadan. I know Massachusetts has really screwy blue laws, <laughs> excuse my language. Wherever beer is sold in your faraway country of Massachusetts, still run by the Puritans apparently, um, there's usually a section devoted to ciders. And then again, depending on your liquor laws, like wine stores might have cider available too. It's all, even federally, it's categorized in really weird ways. All that being said, you might not find the cider makers or the specific apples uh, ciders that I mentioned today, but you know, a lot of modern cider makers are working with heirloom apples. And so it is, and they want to like kind of educate with their cider too. So it's worth just exploring some things, especially if you've never tried cider before to take a few bottles home and see what you got. And thank you, Kathy, I'm glad you enjoyed that. My brother lives outside of Boston. So that's how I know how confusing the laws can be out there. I should also make a correction too, because I'm using this word cider. But in modern America, basically since prohibition, that word has a different meaning here than it does in literally the rest of the world. When we say cider here, we mean the gallon of stuff that you get at the grocery store. It's uh, you know usually fresh pressed, it's usually pasteurized, it's kind of murky, it's delicious, I love it. It's alcohol free. When the rest of the world says cider, and we're beginning to change back to this nomenclature here in America, they mean a fermented alcoholic uh, beverage. Not a spirit usually has an alcohol content uh, in the range of beer, um, but up to like 14 to 16% too. You can get some pretty alcoholic ciders up there. Not quite as like um, uh, high in APV as wine is usually. So this is changing now and the industry at least is beginning to call cider in the grocery store in your freezer section, fresh cider and referring to alcohol as cider. Um, ooh, so such a great question, Lindsay. Okay, so Lindsay asked this question, which university ag research extensions were most influential in developing new apple varieties? So I will preference this by saying that that is, it is not my area of expertise, although I find it quite fascinating. And I'm trying to think now, because I did read a book recently that had a whole chapter. It might be the tastemakers, which even if it's, I think it's in that book, but even if it's not, Jessica, you can um, put, pop that in the chat if it's at your library. Uh, I would also recommend the book American Cider too, just for general cider history. So it's become a thing that these apple licensing, these basically copyrighted apples can generate so much money that it can pay for all of the research a university wants to do in its, <laughs> in its ag department, definitely, but maybe even beyond that. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so a lot of different universities, usually in apple growing regions, have developed some of these copyrighted uh, names. I know definitely the Pacific Northwest, which we're going to talk about today. I think Toronto had one come out. I will say in general, the university that does the most with apples specifically is Cornell, especially their extension in uh, Geneva, New York slash um, Ithaca. Uh, that is actually where the, and I wasn't going to talk about this today too, so this is a cool thing to mention. That is where the USDA's living library of apple trees are. And it is an enormous orchard where they keep hundreds of different apple varieties alive. They also have cold storage as well and, and freezer storage. So cold storage will save like cuttings and seeds um, and freezer storage will save all the genetic material. So they have an enormous living library of apples and apple trees. And actually one of the professors there has begun working uh, directly with a local cider maker in Geneva um, to, to supply apples to the cider maker and also to keep revive some of these heirloom varieties too. So while many different universities have produced uh, patent apples, Geneva has done the most research both into the historical apple industry and, and heirloom apple varieties. And they have done the most research in terms of how to um, make the most effective orchards today too. So they do a lot to support the apple industry um, 
at large? Great question. Okay, let's talk about some historical apples. Let's talk about some real historical apples because apples originated in Kazakhstan. Now we know this because basically any agricultural item, any plant, um, you can identify the region that it's from by identifying the region of its greatest genetic diversity. So outside of Kazakhstan, particularly this place, do you have a photo of it? Oh, this is, this is a wild apple. Okay, particularly this place, this is, these are the mountains outside of a town called Almamata. Um, originally it was called Almamati, which means father apple. So it, the city that it's surrounded by is named after the fact that there's this abundance of apple trees. And there um, are modern culinary baking and dessert apples are from the uh, genus Malus domesticus. And it descended from these wild apples that are called Malus cerversae, okay? But Malus cerversae has an incredible number of varieties. And in fact, no two trees are the same. There are huge apples that are bright green. There are tiny purple apples that look like cherries and there's every, every, everything in between. And they all are growing both in the mountains and in the very, very city around Amamadi in Kazakhstan. Now, just like places in New York that are traditional, uh, in New York and New England that are traditional apple growing regions, a lot of this beautiful land is being sold off for real estate development. And so the, the native wild apple population is disappearing. Um, Slow Food is actually doing some work to help preserve it, but already a lot of these forests are lost. This is a photo of a random apple uh, that was picked from a tree in the forests in the mountains around Amamata. And you can see it look, it could be any baking apple off the shelf, but this is literally a wild apple from which um, modern, um, not commercial, yes, but modern agricultural apples have descended. Um, human beings have been cultivating apples since at least Mesopotamia. So we're talking uh, right around the beginning of agriculture, potentially 11 or 12,000 years ago. We have a little bit more knowledge coming forward. Um, grafting was invented in China about 4,000 years ago. I should say too that apples are actually a very, very old plant. They evolved before the continents split and there are native apple trees in America. There are two different uh, species of nat native apple trees, but those are generally referred to as crab apples um, in America today. So, and they're actually the oldest species too. Uh, Malus cerversi is a little bit more modern. Um, but it's these cerversi, malus cerversi, that were the most delicious, the most edible, the most diverse, and also laid in this place that was basically on the Silk Road. That was It was the connecting path between Europe and places like China, India, Japan. So it's really, the idea is that people who were traveling by foot, by mule, by animal through this area would often pick up the apples and plant the seeds when they got home. The trick, the thing is though, when you plant an apple seed, uh, the genetics in an apple seed are different than the parent plant. It's like human beings have a baby. The baby isn't an exact copy of the parents, right? It uh, has the genetics of both the parents, but it is in fact a different creature. That's the same, well, creature, sorry. <laughs> I've got a niece and she's kind of a creature right now. I love her so much. But you, same thing happens, you plant an apple seed, a different type of tree comes out. To get an exact copy, you have to graft an apple tree, which means you take these little pieces of wood, um, these straight little things, little growths that come off the tree in the springtime. Um, you cut this fresh wood and you are able to bond it to uh, another root structure. And the tree that grows will be an exact copy of the parent tree rather than something that may or may not be similar to the parent tree. So the Chinese invented grafting about 4,000 years ago. So Libby says, are wild apples safe to eat? Yeah, I wouldn't go after any crab apples, uh, which are notorious where I'm from for giving you the, uh, well, they call it the old green apple two-step, right? Um, I have not heard of any wild apples or in this country, you're mostly gonna come across feral apples um, that are, are not good to eat. The only thing that you should be careful of is you should never eat apple seeds. Apple seeds uh, contain cyanide and you really can't eat enough to kill you. So um, stay away from the seeds. But yes, should you find a feral apple tree, um, they are safe to eat. They might not necessarily be good to eat. 
we're going to get a little bit more to that, but that has to do with the genetic diversity contained in those apple seeds. And actually only a small percentage of those apples end up being like crispy, sweet, acidic, and delicious for eating. These are great questions. Whoops. So live done. Okay. So it's the ancient Romans that began really cultivating apples and selecting them for traits that they liked. And um, as far as we can tell, there are actually a couple ancient Roman varieties that are still knocking around. If you've ever seen these little lady apples, they're pretty small, like that big, and they usually appear around Christmas time. They're interestingly a traditional Victorian Christmas tree decoration. Um, these are believed to be an ancient Roman variety that has been propagated for the past couple thousand years, which I think is pretty amazing. So apples, other than our native crab apple varieties, uh, cultivated apples came to America really with the Mayflower. The early waves of Puritans coming into Massachusetts brought apples with them, both in the form of physical apples that they were eating, but also uh, grafts, apple trees that had been grafted on a rootstock that were copies of successful varieties back home. Now, some of our earliest, our earliest mentions of cider making explicitly um, come from Northern Europe in like the eighth and ninth centuries and England in the 1100s. These are areas where the climate is cool and wet and not conducive to growing grain for beer or grapes for wine. And so apples became the fermentable of choice. The same is true of New England. The climate is cold and wet. They had a really hard time growing grain to begin with. So they were growing apples to produce a fermented alcohol. Now, I know we call the Puritans, you know, puritanical, but they were big drinkers. Um, the, these lightly fermented um, small beers and ciders were not considered bad by any reason. And the Puritans um, actually were notoriously quite heavy drinkers. They would drink between 15 and 54 gallons of cider per person per year. So, um, yeah, that's a lot. That's a half gallon every three days. So here's the, here's the deal. I think I used this word before, hetero, heterozygous. So the Puritans come, they're founding their colonies, their little towns, they're putting their grafted apple trees in the ground. These trees die, they can't handle the climate. Yes, Massachusetts is a kind of a cold and wet place like England, but the winters are way more harsh than the, than the mild winters in England. So either the trees were dying over the difficult winters or a late frost was freezing off their blossoms and then you don't get any apples, no flowers, no apples. But the thing is apple seeds have so many genetics. An apple seed has 57,000 different genes a human being, I don't know if there's any geneticist here, but it was something, it's something like 36,000. Let me just say it this way. An apple seed has more genes than a human being, okay? And every apple has five seeds and every apple tree has hundreds of apples. So there are thousands of different apple tree combinations in one tree. So when you, so when the Puritans started planting seeds as opposed to their grafted trees, there was so much genetic diversity going into the ground that some trees died, but others survived. And then if they harvested the apple seeds off of those trees and planted those, the next generation became even better adapted to the new climate. So that's why although apples aren't indigenous to America, they kind of are now because the apples that grow successfully in this country are not the same apples for the most part that grow successfully in England, Spain, France, or New Zealand, okay? So we have our own uh, apple varieties that only grow here. And not only that, some apples are so highly specialized to different areas and climates that they only grow around like certain towns and certain regions in New England or the Midwest or the South or California. So I mentioned they're already big cider drinkers. So cider was their drink of choice because that's what they could get to grow and it was pretty easy to ferment. Um, after they got through a couple generations of pippins, that is what an apple is called when it's grown from a seed. It is a pippin. You might have an orchard where 80% of the trees are kind of trash, um, that the apples are mealy or soft or sour, or like there's the, the right balance isn't there. Most cider apples to this day are called spitters, meaning you take a bite of them and some aspect of them is so disgusting you spit it out. But you might have a couple trees or maybe just one real winner in your orchard of pippin trees that ends up being a really tasty apple. And one example of these early trees was the Newtown pippin. 
The new town Pipfin is grown sometime at the end of the 17th century on Long Island in an area that today is called Elmhurst, Queens, but at the time was called Newtown. It is grown on the estate of the first uh, reverend of the oldest congregation in Queens, and I think they're pres Presbyterian. I think it's the first, the Elmhurst pres Presbyterian, First Presbyterian Church of Queens is what it's currently called. Still exists, still exists. So it's that same thing. They planted a pippin orchard and they selected for apples that they thought had good potential. And the Newtown Pippin becomes particularly popular, especially by the 18th century. It's known as being a delicious crisp eating apple, a nice tart baking apple that holds its shape, and a really, really extraordinary cider apple. Now, people are making cider from their pippin orchards because if you can't eat an apple, if it's a spitter, a lot of times though, you can still harvest them, press them, blend all the juice together and get decent cider out of it. So making cider was largely a way to use an agricultural crop that wasn't good for eating, baking or drying. Um, that could be uh, processed and made into cider, which then either your family would consume or that you could sell or trade for other things that you might need. So there are a few, the Pippin, Newtown Pippins make such a delicious single variety cider that it became famous as being sort of a, one of the best cider apples out there. And to this day by craft cider makers, it is still made into a single variety cider. Now, many of you, if you drink cider, have probably heard of Angry Orchard. Most of their cider is actually made outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's made from like pressed juice concentrates but they also have a cider house in Walden, New York. And that's where they're doing really interesting experiments and sort of like seasonal releases and single variety heirloom apple ciders. This is their tasting room. I was there in early March, which is not, you know, wasn't the most beautiful time of year to be there, but that was the time when they were pressing their pippins. Because although the Newtown pippins are harvested in the early fall, they're really starchy when they come off the tree. And some apples benefit from aging. So as they sit around a couple months, those starches convert to sugars and you get an apple that's more tart and sweet, which is much more desirable. Um, they do a couple single varieties, including their Newtown Pippin. Uh, I tasted this 2018 Newtown Pippin. It tastes a little different every year and they love those differences in the cider. And this year it tasted rather like the smell of the earth in the springtime, which is kind of a beautiful thing to capture in a bottle. Here it is. This is the yeah, a Presbyterian. Okay, I did it. They are uh, the first Presbyterian congregation of Elmhurst, Queens. Um, interestingly, right across from, if you know the area at all, there is, I didn't, I didn't put the picture. The Queens Mall is right is across the street and it's actually right on Queens Boulevard, which is a six lane highway that goes across Long Island. So it's, it looks very pastoral from this angle, but right behind me is a six lane highway. And on the, uh, I think, 400th anniversary of the founding of this church, they planted Newtown Pippins, an orchard of Newtown Pippin, Pippins on their property um, to celebrate this legacy of this really famous apple that grew here. And the Newtown Pippin is so famous. It's, um, it was both Jefferson and uh, Washington grew Newtown Pippins in their orchards. Uh, ben Franklin was also a huge fan of the apple, and when he was an ambassador to England uh, for the Assembly of Pennsylvania, he brought apples with him and launched a Newtown Pippin apple industry that would last for the next 200 years. Queen Victoria loved them too, and she removed import taxes on them, so Americans became uh, millionaires exporting this particular apple to England. Interestingly, though, we know a little bit about Jefferson's Jefferson cider makers, both because of his docu uh, documentation and also because of an oral history. George and Ursula Granger um, were really important enslaved individuals on Monticello in the late 18th century. And in the 1840s, their son, Isaac Jefferson Granger, gave an oral history that was written down. So we have some sort of personal testimony of what their lives were like and what it was like to, to live there. George, George Granger, who was sometimes called Great George or King George, um, was a really interesting and important person because he did a lot of the agricultural oversight at Monticello, and he was eventually promoted to the position of overseer, meaning that he was managing uh, dozens of other enslaved people. And there were no other Black overseers at Monticello, and it was actually really rare to have a Black overseer anywhere. 
So he was both enslaved, but overseeing the enslaved. And he was also making a salary of about $67 a year, about half the much of a white overseer. And he was a supremely talented orchardist and one of the few people that Jefferson would trust to take care of his trees, harvest and process and press the apples into cider. And then his wife, Ursula, or Queen Ursula, she was the only person on the plantation that Jefferson trusted to bottle and then age the cider. And when it came time for that, she could take anyone else she needed to do it, to do the work and get it done. They actually both died fairly young. George, when he was 69, Ursula also in her 60s. Um, Ursula bore nine children over her lifetime, only three of whom made it to adulthood, one being Isaac Jefferson, who not only was his oral history documented, but he is one of the few photographs of someone we have that was that was enslaved at Monticello. By the time this photo was taken, he'd been able to buy his own freedom, because keep in mind, it's the 1840s, slavery is still legal in the South, um, and he spent much of his life working as a blacksmith. So he is in probably his mid to late 70s in this picture, and he looks uh, you know, way, way, way younger than that and also incredibly fit. At the same time, he passes away a few years after his oral history is taken. So Black Americans and Indigenous Americans were often the people in colonial America actually doing the processing of cider on uh, large farms and plantations. How are we doing on time? Yeah. Not good. I talked a lot this time. So I just want to say, too, that you can find Newtown Pippins fairly easily at any sort of diverse orchard, I would say. But you actually may have already consumed one because it's the primary apple used in Martinelli's sparkling cider. So Martinelli's, Martinelli's pays a premium for orchardists to plant and grow Newtown Pippin trees because it is so important to the flavor of their uh, non-alcoholic cider, which I definitely had at my family's Thanksgivings when I was a kid. There's also been a resurgence of planting uh, Newtown Pippin orchards throughout its origin point in Long Island, including this little orchard in Queens College. So I want to talk briefly about two more apples. And um, yeah, if you've got questions at any time, you can always pop them in. The Harrison apple was considered the best cider making apple of the 19th century and apparently commanded a higher price than any other cider apple. They're kind of an ugly looking thing. They are small, they are yellow green. They are usually covered in these black dots. Um, and they originated around modern day Newark, New Jersey, which believe it or not, up through the 19th century was known as the best cider making region in the United States. And the cider that came out of Newark, New Jersey was known as Newark Champagne. So the black dots, I've heard two things about them, Kathy. Um, one is that they are just a natural discoloration in the surface of the apple. Um, and some people have also said that they are a, um, a fungus that's really common to Eastern America. Um, it might be a little column A, a little column E. The image on the drawing on the left here is a historical watercolor, and you can see the black dots are present there too. So it might be in combination of uh, natural imperfections of the skin. And then on the right, these are apples that were actually grown in its home region near Newark, New Jersey. Um, it's really hard. So 95% of organic apples in the United States are actually grown in the Yakima Valley of Washington State, which I think I'm going to show you a picture of. The climate is really, really arid, and that's the reason you can grow organic apples there, because you don't have to treat for the same funguses and blights that you get out east. Um, you all know how humid it is out there by the ocean in June and July. And so this is part of the result of it too. And also why you can't grow organic because you end up having to use chemicals to treat this blight or they destroy your apples. Um, so the Harrisons can take the blight, but they just look a little ugly, but it's not what's on the outside that counts. It's what's on the inside. So speaking of those little apples were grown in an orchard. Oh, could the fungus be part of what makes them good cider apples? Perhaps any flavor plot? No, because that fungus will really get on anything. It's just more apparent on Harrison's. And actually, I don't know a ton about it, so I, I don't want to speak too much. But what makes the Harrison a great cider apple is the apple itself. So I actually tasted probably five or six different ciders that were that were just made from Harrison's, a single variety Harrison across the country. Um, I had some from Ironbound here, which is um, outside of Newark in New Jersey. And um, they really want to recreate historic Newark area ciders. 
Um, I've had them from a grower called Tayatan in the Yakima Valley. Um, oh God, I think Anger Orchard has one. At any rate, the gamut of flavors that both the apple and its cider has run is truly incredible. Some have been funky, some have been tart, some have been sweet. And of course, a lot of that comes from how a cider maker is fermenting it. But at the same time, to be able to get that much diversity and flavor from one single apple is really incredible. It is just a tremendously balanced apple in terms of all the things that are important to making good cider, which are really um, sugar, um, acids, and tannins. Tannins are like when you drink tea, sometimes it's really tannic you, or wine. It's like a sort of dry feeling in your mouth. That's tannins. And you really need a balance of all three of them for a cider to work. So to do a single varietal, one apple has to have all those three qualities to it and Harrison's do. So it's really unique in terms of being an apple, but largely overlooked as an eating apple because it's an ugly little thing. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best way I can put it. So Ironbound Hard Cider established itself purposefully in the Newark area because um, the CEO and their cider makers really are looking to history for inspiration. And they are trying to plant and reclaim a lot of these New Jersey area apples, including the Harrison. Now the Harrison was, in, was considered, do you have some pictures of old Tom Newark? There's uh, these are from, these are from Titan. So actually this is a great comparison. The first ones I showed you from, were from New Jersey. And now these Harrison apples are about the same age, about the same point in their season. And these are from the Yakima Valley. So from a really hot, arid area. So you can still see there's some distinctive black dots, but it doesn't have all of sort of that black uh, web work that the East Coast apples do. So oftentimes apples of any variety, not just the Harrisons are affected by these different blights and funguses just because it's humid. Um, so there is Newark in the 18th century. So it was really an agricultural paradise. And certainly I think a lot different than our perception of Newark today. And some of its uh, first founders planted immense orchards too. So that's part of the reason by the 19th century became known for its cider. There's Newark at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so Newark cider or Newark champagne was a blend of four apples, the Harrison, the Granny Winkle, the Campfield and the Povishelm. And part of the reason it was so famous, uh, not just nationally, but internationally, was really that consistency of the apple blend. I mentioned earlier that up until this point, you had an orchard full of pippins. Some of them were good apples for eating or baking or drying. Most of them were, were spitters, so you blended them into cider. But your mix was gonna be a little bit different every year, and you weren't selecting individual trees that had one of those three aspects, tannins, acid, or sweetness, to make a good cider. Um, that's what made Newark cider different, that it was a consistent blend of the Harrison and usually these three other apples. Sometimes they would just use one or two other apples. Okay. So they found this common apples that made a great quality cider and stuck with it and became very, very, very famous for it. So on the other hand, wait, let's go back to this for just one second. By the 1970s, the Harrison had absolutely disappeared to the point where no one had heard of it, okay? So it was this hugely famous apple through the 19th century, and then basically prohibition comes about and it's just gone. Not just prohibition, but we know Newark is being a huge industrial center today. So the orchards were sold off, factories were built, and the trees began disappearing. In the 70s, um, there's this guy named Paul Guides who is actually studying uh, neuro neurobiology but like takes up cider making as a hobby. And he starts looking into 19th century books to find um, apples that would make really good at the time he wanted sweet cider. And he comes across all these mentions of the Harrison in apple text as being the best cider making apple. And he reaches out to Geneva actually to Cornell and says, do you have this apple? He reaches out to orchards, no one's heard of it. So he decides to go look for it himself. So he drives from where he's living in New Hampshire down to the Newark area. Um, he decides to start a bit west of Newark in an area called Livingston. And so he stops at a like a strip, yeah, like a strip mall, you know, parking lot, couple stores. He walks into a bagel shop and says to the guy behind the counter, hey, are there like old cider mills around here? And the guy's like, yeah, Nettie Ox is right up the street. That place has been there a long time. 
So he heads up the street to Nettie Ox Orchard, which had actually been founded in the 1850s. And this is exactly what he's looking for. He wanted to find an old orchard site and then see if there were any Harrison apple trees still there that he could take cuttings from and then graft the trees. So he knocks on the front door of this house, introduces himself. He actually can see in the backyard that there is a tree with yellow little yellow apples on it. And he said he's looking for Harris and apple trees. The owner, the, the current Ock, I actually don't remember his what his name was, said, yeah, that's my last one. My grandfather planted it at the turn of the century. I'm about to cut it down to make room for a vegetable garden. So Paul goes around back. He cuts those, um, shoot, I'm thinking of the suckers is one name for them, but it's not quite the one I want, but that new straight growth that he can graft. Actually goes back the next spring, he can get a few more. He propagates some Harrisons in his orchard. He plants some to friends, but he has no idea how rare this tree is because it was easy for him to find. And in fact, other palmologists had been looking for this apple tree for 30 years without success. And it wasn't until a couple years later where he read an article basically talking about how rare this tree was by a man named Tom Burford, who was considered one of the greatest palmologists of the modern era. He just passed away in 2020 sends some of his cuttings and apples to Tom. Tom realizes this is the long lost Harrison and uh, begins his life's work of propagating this apple tree across America. Um, as one pomologist said, it's like if we rediscovered the Pinot Noir grape after it had been gone for a century, and this is the first time anyone got to taste it, that's the Harrison apple. However, in you know, a lot of these trees are being saved in the nick of time because I wanted to go visit this historical site where the Harrison was found in the 1970s, like an important site and also this orchard um, and only to find that it had been raised to make way for condos. And I've even noticed since I was a kid that housing developments are always named after what they tore down. In this case, it's going to be the cider mill townhomes. But the tree lives on. Um, there's Tom Burford. Uh, again, he's written some incredible books and really, Repropagating the Harrison was probably his greatest contribution to agriculture. And this is a field that I stood in in uh, Yakima Valley, Washington. It supplies an, a cidery called Tayatam, and they have 3,000 Harrison apple trees planted in their orchard. And these are all grafts made from grafts, made from grafts from that one single tree in the back of Nettie Ox Orchard. So this is really a success story of this apple. And although you're not gonna find it on your grocery store shelves, you might find it on your grocery store shelves in the form of apple cider. Um, Harrison, which is a great company out of Denver, uh, excuse me, Haken, which is a great company out of Denver, makes a great Harrison as does Tieton. Um, it's a really interesting apple and often included in different blends too. And more cideries are uh, including a list of all of their apples that go into the bottle. Things you can see right in the chat. We have Apples in North America by Tom Burford. But here's the issue. So Ironbound Cidery in Newark really wanted to make Newark cider. And so Harrison's had been reestablished. Granny Winkles and Camp Fields had never been lost, but no one had seen a Povichon apple in about a hundred years. Here's an 1830s drawing of one. Um, an article was written about Ironbound and their quest to re recreate Newark cider. And uh, the article this is in Edible Jersey. And the article included sort of a, a wanted poster again with the drawing and description of what this apple looked like. And the CEO of Ironbound saying, I'm just hoping that someone has it in their backyard and they don't know. So this article had to be picked up by Wesley Stokes. Um, Wesley and Robin Stokes were Newark residents, are Newark residents, and they also owned some property in upstate New York, where they had just been and had collected a couple bags off the feral apple trees that were growing in their woods. Wesley picked up this article, looked at that picture, and said, I think that's our apple. The pomologist descended. They're invited up to the property, which Wesley, through some research, found out had been owned by farmers from Newark. And in fact, the whole area at the uh, mid-19th century had been populated by people who had come from Newark. The apple was sent out to several pomologists, including Tom Burford, and they confirmed that this was, in fact, the long-lost Povichon apple. Let me show you some of the trees that this apple grew on. Um, based on the appearance of the trees and also the dimensions of the orchard, and there's a couple other things that go in there too, it's estimated that these apple trees are about 180 years old. Literally, there are holes rotted through the middle of them, but they're still producing apples every year. Some of them maybe just three or four or five apples. Um, 
but they are very, very lovingly taken care of by the Stokes. They've sort of built crushes to, crutches to hold up their limbs. Um, now that it's realized how precious these are, they're also, they're still producing that graft wood that can be cut and propagated. So every single spring, people are coming and taking this graft wood and they're propagating this tree to try to get it back into orchards too. So another apple that was say probably just in the nick of time. And this was only rediscovered in 2017, 2018. And so it was in the process of being grown out to be, to get enough of them to be pressed into cider. So, you know, there's a chance that you might have a rare or endangered or lost apple growing in your backyard. You might have even seen this post. It was going around Facebook. It was going on Reddit. This is a photo of a man named Tom Brown. And ever since he retired about 40 years ago, he's still alive. He's still out there kicking and finding apples. He decided to make it his life's goal to find apples, specifically in his region in North Carolina. There's also an apple hunting club in the Pacific Northwest, but Tom Brown has a great newsletter and he also also offers help on his website in terms of how you can help find lost apples. It's so sweet too. It says, how do I find lost apples? It is simple. Finding lost apples is actually very simple. You should talk about apples to as many elderly people as possible. These older people are a treasure of information and they still remember many apple names, descriptions, and locations. So he also goes on to say, I love this part where it says, I know nothing about old apples, can I still help? And he says, yes, yes. A retired minister in Wilkes County, North Carolina knows only a couple of old apples, but he knows hundreds of people. With his help, I found 10 very rare apples. I called an Avery County woman who someone had casually mentioned. I asked her if she had any suggestions of who I should contact in Avery County. She suggested five people. I followed up and found six lost apples. When my leads ran out, I called her back and asked her if she had any other suggestions. She gave me three more names. I found three more apples. She did not know what apples any of these people had. She was just making logical suggestions of people she thought might have a few apple trees. So they also say, um, he also gives you advice on contacting. So if you've got an apple, here's the steps that you take. You should first take any found apple to a local orchard who should be able to identify it as any sort of uh, known commercial or known heritage apple species, okay, or variety, excuse me. And if they can't identify it, he says, then go talk to the old people, go to a diner where people were there, uh, go to the early bird dinner, go to early weekend breakfast and start asking around, ask if anybody remembers who used to own the property it was on, if anybody remember this apple's name. If through either of those, the apple is identified, you know, then you can start doing some Googling or you can go to some of the historical sources and see if the description matches the name you were given. If nobody still knows what the apple is, or if a name was given and you can't find it in any of the historical records, then you can take the step of reaching out to a pomologist. You can reach out to the USDA, either at uh, the Apple Extension in Geneva or at UC Davis, which also holds a genetic library of apples. You can send genetic material and it can be tested against the living libraries. And if there's no match found, this might be a lost heirloom apple, but it's always hard to tell. you got to sort of match the historical descriptions. So his website is amazing. He seems so sweet. So if you've got some apples around, it's worth reaching out. Thank you for putting the link in. And so that is it for me. Do you have questions? about anything? Hi, Sarah, that was great. Um, so I noticed in the one one thing I was thinking about, and it's probably a really stupid question, but um, I'll, I'll waste some time here. <laughs> um, do you, uh, I noticed in the picture of the um, Harrison apple, the cross section was yeah. asymmetrical. And is that, is that um, something that's typical of, uh, you know, older varieties of apples? And now that we've been kind of propagating them and oh, like really well pollinating them? Great question. Um, it has more to do with selection. So like we want our, our grocery store apples to be, now we like stripey. So like a gala apple or a Fuji is big. But if you think of a red delicious, that apple tastes so bad because it was selected on visual qualities and sweetness. It is a perfectly red, perfectly symmetrical, pleasantly sized, very sweet apple. And now it's been selected so much for those traits that it's also mealy and disgusting and lacks any acidity. 
So most grocery stores um, are picking, uh, uh, and still to this day, apple growers are paid for the appearance of apples, a really red apple, a really perfect apple, a really even apple, not like for their flavor. Cider apples, nobody cares. They're getting mashed into apples. So they are often considered ugly Mm -hmm. by contemporary apple eating standards. So I always encourage people to eat ugly apples because you know those, those apple varieties at the orchard that maybe aren't perfect, that don't look desirable, could be really, really, really delicious. Mm. Um, so gold grocery stores offer only the exact same half dozen or so types. Comes from that era uh, right after Prohibition when uh, apple growing focused on baking and eating apples. And uh, basically the marketing team has just decided it was easier to focus on a half dozen apples rather than a couple hundred. Um, And so farmers who are ripping out their cider orchards anyway, planted the same half dozen apples uh, that looked pretty and tasted sweet. And that's how we get to today. Mm. Do I have a favorite apple or apple cider or apple desserts? I love, okay, I'm I'm gonna send you on a quest, Jess. It's on fourpoundsflower.com. It is called, Huguenot tort. I'm going to write the name of it. It is the most delicious apple dessert I have ever made. And Jess is going to find the link to it and drop it in the chat. It is so different. It is a crispy meringue on top. It's like a cur- like a, a gooey, caramely apple pecan situation on the bottom. It is amazing. And it looks kind of ugly, but it tastes really, really incredible. So that is my favorite. I do love Newtown Pippins because they're such a diverse apple and they will, they last forever. Um, And I love the historical connection, of course. Uh, More and more orchards are growing them. Red Jacket Orchard actually has a pretty large uh, orchard of them because they sell to Angry Orchard. Um, But if you can come across those, I think those are really great. I just love going to an orchard and usually now they might have like, you know, 30 different varieties. All of them are labeled. And, um, you know, you can buy one each and just try them all. And I think that that is so, 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 so much fun. Um, Cider, I actually really do love Haken Cider, which does ship from Denver. I don't think they're, uh, you can probably look on their website to see where they might sell in grocery stores, but I think it's largely a Western thing, but they're making some really beautiful and incredible ciders. So are people researching historical documents about apple varieties that may be lost? How we know about apples no longer exist? That's exactly it, Joyce. You hit the nail on the head. Um, shoot, I thought maybe I had the book near me. The most famous one is a book by William Cox, who, and it was written in the 1830s. Um, and he, this guy was from Newark. So that's the big resource for the Harrison. So he lists a lot of different apple varieties, but there were also throughout the 19th and even into the early 20th century, there were, there were several encyclopedic apple documents that came out. Several of them were also produced by the USDA. And this is where we get our 14,000. And so each of these provide descriptions of the apple itself, the tree, when it ripens, the flavor that then can we both use to figure out what apples were missing. And then if something is found, we can start trying to align it with different historical sources. That's in a way is what happened with the Povichon because it is such an, uh, it's a very unique looking apple as well. It is fairly small like the Harrison, but it's rather flat and kind of like like a, like a, a donut peach. You know what I mean? It's kind of shaped like that. And it's got these really unique stripes down the side. So of course, if it's a really distinctive looking apple that makes matching it to a historical description a lot easier. The Povichon doesn't look like any other apple. So Anne, when I was a kid, you could still find Rhode Island greenings in New Jersey. I haven't seen them anywhere for years, which is a shame because it's the best apple for pie. Why do apples start to go extinct? Is it because most people just get apples from supermarkets and they limit their varieties to what sells easily? Yes. And because most of these thousands of varieties were used for cider and we stopped drinking cider for about 150 years. That's it. It was placed by beer, was outlawed by prohibition, and then the industry just didn't spring back because literally these trees were getting ripped out of the ground. I'd be curious if you could find Rhode Island greenings out there because now there is this real resurgence in bringing diversity back to our agriculture, that the thing that ships the best or looks the prettiest isn't the most delicious, which is affects not just apples, but really grocery store plants of all different varieties and species. Um, the assumption is that uh, grocery stores still buy from orchardists based on appearance. That's really it. Um, so we can go to, you can change this, 
by asking about different apples at your grocery store, by going to local orchards and supporting them. And it's a blast to try apple varieties you've never heard of. I hope, Anne, that you can find an orchard that still sells Rhode Island greenings um, and that you could get to try them again. Was Johnny Appleseed real? Why was he so devoted to propagating apples? I will give you the three second story of Johnny Appleseed, but I will also recommend a source. Um, so Michael Pollan's uh, The Botanist's Desire, I might be quite misphrasing that book a little bit, but you should be able to find it. He did a lot of research into Johnny Appleseed. He was absolutely real. And um, he, okay. He's a weird guy, honestly. He sounds, let me preface this by saying he sounds really irritating and he might have been a pedophile, which uh, which is why I don't really talk about him in my in my talks. And also he was so devoted to propagating apples because it was actually a real estate scheme. So he was going out to Ohio and then Indiana in the very early 19th century. Um, and he was getting land really cheap as a uh, the, the federal government was selling it off to begin propagating these territories to get, get people in there. And the land was considered developed if it had a cider orchard in it. So it had to do with like, you could be given a land grant, but you had to develop the land within a certain number of years. And developing was judged by a couple things, but the main thing was, is there an apple orchard? That was considered, you have now converted this into farmable land that can support people, okay? Thank you, Botany of Desire. Um, so he would get the land grants like cheap to free, he would walk through and plant a bunch of pippins, the trees would grow up, and then he could sell that land off as developed land. And people wanted it because it already did have this resource on there that could provide like eating or baking apples, but mostly provided the basis for cider. Interestingly, some of his pippins did become commercial varieties, including the Red Delicious. The Red Delicious is grafted from a Johnny Appleseed tree. There are, according to Pollen, a couple Johnny Appleseed planted trees still in existence in Southern Ohio. But basically he was doing it not because he really loved apples, he was doing it as part of like a real estate turnaround scheme. And though he, though he lived a very ascetic lifestyle, he was probably a millionaire. There you have it. Great questions. Thank you, everyone. I, I can tell you enjoyed this talk so much. And so I'm really excited for my book to come out. Again, it's been a long road since 2018. And it's these stories, but more in depth. And then of course, seven other chapters about other foods that connect deeply to local cultures. Oh yeah, heart. And then is that, I think this is also the one, okay. So Jessica just put a New York Times article about ironbound and cider propagation. I believe that's also the one that mentions the Stokes and the revival of the Pobichon apple in the past couple of years. It's just like really cool stuff that gets me nerdy and excited. So get some of those books out of the library and soon enough, you'll be able to get my, my new book out of the library and we're definitely gonna do some stuff around it too. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. And don't forget, uh, Sarah will be back uh, in October, on October 20th for Food History Horror Stories. Thank you so much for this awesome presentation. My pleasure. Thank you again, everyone. Good night. Have a great night.